Hi everyone. Welcome to the Seeds of Success Caring, Creating a Caring Classroom webinar. I'm Laura Candler from Teaching Resources and most of you probably know me from my Teaching Resources website which is lauracandler.com. Um, everyone knows that the first few days of school are the most important ones of the year. But, you know, sometimes it's hard to know how to begin. You hear a lot of different stories and you wonder, should you be super strict or should you be relaxed, have a good time with your class? Should you start them off in straight rows or should you start them off in cooperative learning teams? You know, what's the best way to begin? So these are some really good questions for a collaborative webinar and that's exactly what we have going on this evening. I've invited uh, four wonderful teacher blogger friends that I've collaborated with for to um, help me answer some of those questions and share some of their own strategies. Um, I have a website, as you saw, the Teaching Resources website, but I also have a blog, Corkboard Connections, and we'll have Christy Fultz from Mrs. Fultz's, whoops, I see a mistake there because it should say Mrs. Fultz's Corner, and Mandy Neal, Teaching with Simplicity, um, Ari Huddleston, The Science Penguin, and Rachel Lynette, Minds in Bloom. And there's really no particular order to it except we kind of tried to flow the topics um, as they naturally went through the webinar. So um, they'll be introducing themselves as um, they're doing their part in the webinar in a few minutes. Um, I also wanted to let you know that uh, you don't need to be furiously taking notes and writing down links because we're all going to be sharing a lot of links and resources. Um, Peggy George, um, one of the moderators, and I should have introduced her and Francie at the beginning. I need to go back and uh, speak about Peggy and Francie for just a minute. But Peggy is going to be, um, or actually has put together, a live binder with all of the resources from this webinar. And if you look on the left side when you go to that link, you don't have to go to it now. I mean, you can if you want, but I um, hate for you to get sidetracked from the things that are being shared. But it's all there for you. Everything that we're sharing in the webinar is going to be there in that live binder, which is just kind of a collection of online resources. And uh, Peggy is the one who has put all that together, and I realized that I never introduced Francie and Peggy, I guess because we were chatting at the very beginning before the webinar actually started. But Francie and Peggy are the moderators and they kind of work behind the scenes to keep things going smoothly, answering questions, helping out. Um, uh, Francie spoke earlier about Donors Choose. You kind of know her as the Donors Choose lady if you've been following following my blog and my website because she did a webinar with me a couple of years ago on that topic. She's a fifth grade teacher uh, from Los Angeles, California. And Peggy is from Phoenix, Arizona and she's a retired educator and a lot of you know her from uh, Classroom 20 Live or if you've been to my webinars before, she's the moderator, one of the moderators for my webinars. And she's just very techy and she's the one that I always go to when I have questions um, about techy things and I need help. And like binders. Uh, that was her idea to um, gather resources together and I think you'll find that to be really helpful. Okay, um, before we get started with our presentations we thought it'd be fun to find out a little bit about you. And so Peggy, could you give us back the whiteboard permissions again so that they can use the starburst if they double click on it and then put a little starburst under the plant that shows how many years you've been teaching or if you're no longer in the classroom, you know, working with students. So are you somewhat of a newbie, you've been around 11 to 20 years, 21 plus, and then in the chat box would you actually type how many years you've been teaching or working in education and we can actually see some numbers. Um, it's, you have to like double click on the starburst if you're having a hard time getting it working. Okay. We have some, I see zero, so I guess we've got some brand new teachers. I think this is a wonderful place to, to start to get some ideas from um, some of us and also from people who are sharing things in the webinar. Okay. All right, I guess we can turn off those permissions and um, and I'll get started as soon as we do that and we'll move on with the, uh, the next um, part of the webinar. Okay, um, 
my part of the webinar is I'm going to be sharing some strategies with you on cooperative learning and behavior management. And I only have, um, each of us is only going to take about eight to ten minutes at the most to share our strategies. So it's going to be hard to share a lot. But I'm hoping I can uh, share with you a few key points. Um, I taught um, elementary school, upper elementary, for over 29 years. And most of that was in fourth and fifth grade. Um, and you know, I've had people tell me, oh, I would never teach fifth grade. <clears throat> but I love fifth grade. I spent most of my time in fifth grade. And I guess with fifth grade, it's maybe it's true with every grade, but you really have to find that right kind of balance of structure. You've got to have enough structure that your students feel comfortable in the classroom, and they feel safe, and they feel respected. But you also have to have choice, and you have to have options, and you have to make it fun so that they want to be there and they want to learn. I remember I had a student one time who I think paid me the greatest compliment. Um, he was bringing his little sister in on open house because he had had me the year before. And he said, one thing I like about your classroom was um, you know, some teachers do fun things from time to time, but everything you did with us was fun. And you know, I know that's not true because we had tests and we had other things. But it just really made me feel good because I know that by using a lot of cooperative learning strategies and having kids work together, um, things that were just regular, ordinary things became um, exciting to them. So let me share with you a little bit about how um, I like to get that started. I think the first thing that I think is really important is to think about when your students come to you conveying to them the message that you believe in them and that you know they are going to be the very best class that you've had. And that doesn't matter even if you've heard from previous year's teachers that you know, you've got these kids that are going to be really challenging and really tough to work with. Um, don't even listen to it because a lot of times the kids that are really challenging and tough for other teachers are ones that are my absolute favorite kids. They might be a bit of a challenge, but they're also fun and they're lively and they have a great sense of humor or something. And I'm sure you've all had this experience where somebody else had difficulty with the student, but you were just that right teacher who could connect with the child. So um, be real careful not to get caught up into listening to these stories from from people that are going to try to give you advice about a certain child that's coming to you. Um, another thing is with the self-fulfilling prophecy, I know you all know what that is, the idea that if you believe something is going to happen, that somehow subconsciously you make it happen. I think this is so true with your expectations for students. And at one time I went into a teacher's lounge. I was walking through, and I heard um, some teachers kind of joking around. And, and one teacher said, well, you know, I had a really great class last year, so I guess this is going to be my year to get the, the class from you know where. And you know, I, when I walked out, I didn't say anything, but when I walked out, I thought, you know, wow. You know, it's kind of like, have you already predetermined in your mind that, you know, I mean, I guess they were just joking around, but still, I think we have to be really careful about uh, making assumptions about our classes when they come to us, maybe based on what we've heard from the previous year. And I used to tell my students that it seemed like every year my kids got better and better, and that I enjoyed them more and more, and I knew we were going to have a great year. And uh, my friend Pat Kelsey, who also does workshops with me, I think she told me that she told her kids that she knew that the principal put all the best kids in her class. And you know, you can just see the kids kind of puff up with pride when you say that. Now, I did have a teacher. I, I wrote a blog post about this, and there's going to be a link in the live binder to it. And last week, a teacher wrote something on there that she tells her kids something like that. And some of the other teachers on her grade level were kind of offended because they said that's kind of like she's um, putting down their classes. But I feel like if every teacher tells their kids that, you know, it's just a great way to start the year. And um, I don't think you should let that stop you. Or maybe just say, you know, try to make it sound like it's not putting their class down, but you know you're going to have a great year. And then the last point on this slide was to um, be sensitive to the fact that even though you're trying to give kids, uh, you know, these kids are brand new to you and you don't want to make judgments about them, those students have probably been together and they've seen the best and the worst about each other. And I've even had kids come up to me and let's privately they'll say things like, um, please don't put me on a team with so-and-so because we just didn't get along last year. 
And I would say to them, you know, whisper back to them, how about let's just give them a chance this year? You know, maybe things will be different. And everybody deserves a fresh start. And I tell the whole class that from the very beginning. And I'm just, I come right out and say, you know, I don't really want to hear about what might have happened between you and other classes. We're going to give everybody a brand new start. You don't know why, it, you know, maybe it was the way it was. But let's give everybody a brand new start. So I think it's a good um, thing to say on the very beginning of the day. Now, this is a picture of me reading a book to my class, but I like to have a class meeting um, and to start off with and share some of those strategies. OK. Um, I just want to tell you a little bit about um, how I like to get cooperative le learning teams set up in the classroom. I wish I had a lot of time to go into specific cooperative learning strategies, but just a little bit to help you get started. Um, there's a lot of ways you can arrange your teams. And what I preferred is what I just started calling the tea table arrangement. And I hope you can see in the slide what it's like. A lot of people see kids so that um, there's two like shoulder buddies on each side. But I preferred to have the people, at the, the two kids at the back kind of facing the front of the classroom. And it seemed like it made them a little bit closer as a team, too, so that they were all sort of looking at each other. And then they were able to look at the front of the room when they're working. Um, there's a lot of discussion um, on the, between teachers about what to do on the first day. Do you start kids off in rows at the beginning? I know a lot of people say, I'm just not comfortable putting my kids in teams on the first day. I really want to get to know them. But if you're thinking that, I kind of like to challenge you to perhaps think about it a different way. Because if you start them off in rows, and then after a week you put them in teams, it's kind of saying to them, um, we work in rows in here, but when it's time to have fun, we'll work in teams. But it's not like the way we normally work. Whereas if you start them off in teams from the very beginning of the year, it's like you're training them in the way you want them to act. On the first day of school, they're usually pretty good. They're willing to try to get along with each other. And to me, that's the best time to um, start them off in teams and start teaching them some social skills about how they can get along with each other. Um, I like to do mixed ability teams of four because they're um, easy to divide into pairs. And if you do um, uh, content area things where you need to regroup them, you can do that. But for just day-to-day -day, um, work, we stayed in mixed ability teams of four. Um, another thing I like to do is on the first three days of school, I made new teams every single day. And it was a little bit annoying because they had their books and they had to pile all their books up on top of their you know, desk and then carry them to a new seat each day. But I found that um, it served a couple of purposes. One is I don't really know the kids well enough to put them in permanent teams. And by putting them in new teams every single day, I can start observing their interactions with each other. And I can see maybe who should not be on a team together and who does work well together. And it just gives me a lot of information that when I put their uh, regular teams together, I, I feel like I know something about them. And the other purpose that it serves is it helps them really get to know each other. Because if they're on different teams um, for three different days and we do team building activities, then they're really getting to know you know, like about um, 10 or 11 kids quite well at the beginning of the year. So, um, and, and it just, you know, it's just a kind of a fun way to, for everybody to get to know each other. And then I would suggest trying to do at least one team building activity each day during the first week. Um, and I don't know if you're familiar with the difference between team building and class building. Sometimes they're used interchangeably. But um, I was trained by Kagan, uh, Spencer Kagan, Dr. Spencer Kagan. And they use the term team building to be when you've got the kids in teams of three or four or whatever, and class building when you're doing uh, larger group activities that involve the whole class. And both types of activities are really important. Um, Another thing about cooperative learning, I know that some people feel like it's really quite a challenge. Um, they're a little bit leery about it. If you haven't used it before, it can be a little bit scary. But with the new Common Core standards, if you think about the speaking and listening standards, you really have to have them in teams working together to meet some of those standards. And research has really shown that when you use cooperative learning in a structured way, using something like what they're doing here, the kids are doing a structure called showdown. Um, when you use it in a structured way, it's very, very effective. If you're just saying, talk it over with your team, talk it over with your team, um, that's really unstructured cooperative learning that's more like group work. And um, I would suggest uh, looking up some of the Kagan strategies. Um, it's kaganonline.com. And there's a great book. Uh, 
I just think of it as kind of the Bible of cooperative learning, which is Dr. Kagan's big book, Cooperative Learning. And on my Cooperative Learning webpage that I have on my site, which is in the Live Binder, um, I have a link to that book. Um, and there's just so many strategies that you can use, but it has been shown to be very, very effective. And I guess the last point that I want to make about cooperative learning, if you're sort of you know, not sure about it, um, is that if you feel frustrated because you feel like your kids don't get along, um, it kind of brings to mind um, a teacher who one time told me, well, I would do more cooperative learning uh, with my students. I would have them in cooperative learning teams more if they were better at it. And I just kind of looked at him and I said, so that kind of sounds like um, I'm not going to teach math because my kids aren't very good at it. <laughs> and he just kind of looked at me and laughed. And I said, you know, if they aren't good, and if they don't know how to get along, the solution is not to keep them in rows. The solution is to put them in pairs or put them in teams and start teaching them the social skills and things that they need to learn to work together and get along with each other. So, um, and, and cooperative learning isn't for all day long. It's not for taking tests. It's for practice. And there should definitely be times during the day when kids are doing things um, that are challenging them on their own levels. They should not always be made to be tutoring somebody and that kind of thing. So there's a lot of misconceptions about cooperative learning. But there's definitely a big um, place for it in education, I believe. And the last thing I wanted to share with you is if you're going to be having students work in cooperative learning teams, um, you're going to need some kind of behavior management system. And this is one that I learned years ago. And I, as soon as I started using it, I never had a need to go for any other uh, system. In fact, this same uh, bulletin board, you know, I refreshed it every year, but it was in my classroom every year. So I'm going to tell you how it works. I do have a blog post where I explain it. And there's a little packet that you see down there at the bottom that's actually a um, product called Go for Green Stoplight Management. But it is the free item that I'm giving you um, for watching the live webinar. So those of you that are on the live session will get it at the end. But you don't even really need that. That just has some printables and things. But let me just tell you how it works real quickly. I'm going to have numbered pockets on the bulletin board, one per student. Um, I don't put their names on it. It's kind of a privacy issue. I want numbers there. And I have a modified stoplight. It has green, yellow, orange, and red. And the reason for that is I wanted a little intermediate step along the way. And as you've probably guessed, green is the good place to be. And everybody starts out with a green tag or green ticket in their pocket. Different teachers call it different things. And when they're behaving inappropriately or they're off task, I just walk over there and I just switch their tag or their ticket to yellow. I just pull a little yellow ticket out and put it in front of the green one. Now, you can have students do it on their own. But if kids have an attitude, they might go over and just kind of slam it in there. And then you know, it kind of defeats the purpose. So usually, I would just walk over there and do that. And if they turn to yellow, I didn't. Um, you know, there was no real consequence, except I recorded it on a chart at the end of the day. And then at the end of the week, I could see how many times um, you know, they turned to yellow. But if they turned to orange, there was a consequence, like a timeout um, chart. Um, if they went to red, that was for something serious, like fighting or whatever. And the little steps along the way were for kind of minor things. You know, if, if the kid's on green, but then they would haul off and punch somebody, I mean, they don't go to yellow for that. You know, they immediately, they're on red, and I'm calling the parent or turning them, you know, take them to the office or whatever the appropriate strategy is. So you have to kind of use the whole thing flexibly. But what I really liked about this system is that it's very clear and organized, and it puts you in charge in the classroom without having to argue with students about things. You don't have to lecture. You don't have to stand around and wait for them to get on task. If a student is misbehaving, you know, first kind of look at them and make sure that they understand. You know, give them the little teacher eye so they know, um, you know, I've got my eye on you, and let's get back on task. But if they ignore that, you just go change your tag to yellow. And they know that you've taken an action, and you haven't had to say anything. And it takes you out of that role of arguing with students. You know, kids know that teachers care. And if they think they can argue with you, um, they're going to try to do that. And they're trying to get you to sympathize with them. Um, from time to time, I'll have a student get upset and you know say it's not fair and I didn't do it or whatever. And if I think that they are really sincere about that, 
you know, I won't argue with him, but I'll say, well, how about if you write me a little letter about it and let me read it and then I'll look it over and then we can talk about it later. And, you know, half the time they're not going to write me anything because they're just mad. But other times maybe there was something that I didn't see and maybe it wasn't fair. And so by them having the opportunity to write a letter to me and let me know about it, um, you know, I'm able to kind of put them at ease. So anyways, those are my um, three things that I wanted to share with you. And if you have any questions about any of this, then at the very end of the webinar, I'll be happy to answer them. But um, it's time <laughs> to move on because we have four more people. But one more thing, I'm not going to read through all of this, but this is just a, link, a list of the links that are in the live binder for my section. Um, most of them are things that I've already mentioned to you. And just to let you know, those are there. So. Now we have Christy Fultz from Mrs. Fultz's Corner. And Christy, I'm sorry I put your wrong um, name of your blog at the beginning. How many times have we looked at those slides and we never caught that? That's what I was just thinking too. Anyway, I didn't notice I either. I let you introduce you. It's like all of us have looked at those slides a dozen times and we never noticed it. But anyways, I'll let you take over from here and introduce yourself and share your strategies. Perfect. Thanks. Um, I am Christy Fultz from Ms. Fultz's Corner. I live just outside of Dayton, Ohio, but I'm actually a third grade teacher in Indiana. And so today I'm really going to talk to you about building relationships with your students and the students with each other, as well as setting expectations for the year. And I think it's really important that during those first few days you jump in there and you find a way to make a productive classroom um, right from the start. You know, I want my students to make connections with me, and I want them to build relationships with each other. But I also want to set the tone for our year and set some expectations that we're going to stick to all year long. So what I'm going to do today is actually talk to you about four things you're probably really familiar with. Um, I'm sure we've all seen KWL charts, Venn diagrams, class promises, and scavenger hunts. But we're going to put a little twist on those. So I'm going to start with the KWL chart. Um, if you're not familiar with the KWL chart, which I'm sure most of us are, it's typically used with nonfiction. And you're letting students record things they know, they want to know, and then things that they've learned at the end. But the twist on this is I have them fill it out about me. Because they come to us with perceptions about us already, whether they're negative, like you give the most homework at the grade level, or you're the meanest teacher, or whether they are positive, like they hear about a unit you do every year. You know, my kids come to me and they're always really excited about our space unit. So letting them fill out what they know gives them a chance to get that out of the way. Then I let them write down some questions, things that they want to know about me. And for the most part, they're really relevant questions. They want to know if I'm married. They want to know if I have kids. They want to know what my favorite color is or my subject that I like the best. And I like this because it lets them know me on a personal level. But here's the best part. When they're ready to ask me the questions to fill in the learned part, they have to listen to each other. So if someone's asked me the question already, they can't ask it again. So they have to listen to each other as we whip around the room and they kind of learn to take notes and write down um, my answers. So that's something really simple you could do. For the younger students, you could do it like in a buddy, or you could even do some of the writing for them um, on the board. The next idea I have is another familiar chart. It's a, whoops, there it goes, a Venn diagram. So the Venn diagram are those two overlapping circles. It's where they write similarities in the middle. And then they write things that are different on the outside. But again, the twist on this is that they do it about each other. So for my third graders, I use a me chart first, where they record stuff like their interests and their favorite colors or what they did over the summer. But for my older students, I didn't need that chart. They were old enough that they didn't need the scaffold. Um, so initially, they fill out the chart, or they kind of make a list of things about them. And then I have them make connections with each other. And I pick a partner, and I put them in pairs. And I purposely pick people who haven't interacted a whole lot um, so far during the first week and buddy them up. And I like this because it gets them to appreciate the differences in others. They meet some new friends. 
and they learn things about each other too. So they learn who the math whiz is, or they learn who the artist is, and they kind of make those connections. Um, my favorite part is that I turn it into a writing activity. So when they're finished, they flip it over onto the back, and they write a paragraph about their buddy, and how that buddy is the same as them, or how that buddy is different than them. And I like it because it's kind of sneaky. I use it as an informal writing assessment. I can see who's using paragraphs. I can see who's using conventions. I can see who's willing to write easily and who it's maybe a struggle to get to write. Um, and they typically enjoy it because they're writing about themselves or they're writing about a buddy. And then um, if there's time and the kids want to, lots of times I let them present it to the class. Um, and these are, I'm seeing lots of questions, these are in the gift pack. Um, on the next page, I have my class promise. And I like this because it builds a team identity. We talk a lot about our expectations for the year. And I think you should do that right up front. And I think you should do that with your class. So as we talk about what we want our classroom to look like, we talk about how we want to treat each other, then we kind of form a class motto. Because if we think about it, the students are with us during the day, a lot of the time more than they're with their families in the evening by the time they get done with all of their events. So we really do become a family in our classroom. So when we're finished, I make a class promise on chart paper. And it kind of is our rules and our expectations all tied into one. But I like to focus on things that they will do instead of things that I don't want them to do. So typically it starts something like, as a class, we promise to you know, share and support each other, um, always do our best. And then I hang it in the hallway and everyone finds it. Kind of take it an extra step, I let them make paper plate faces. And I like these because they take pride in it, because it's going in the hallway. And it's kind of a little self-portrait. You can kind of see um, how they think about themselves. And here's a bonus tip for you. If you're doing it before parent night or open house, if you take their paper plate faces and put them um, on the back of their chairs, it kind of looks like the kids are sitting in their chair. And at my previous school, the kids actually would bring in like a t-shirt to dress their chair to. I have one final idea for you, and that's a classroom scavenger hunt. Again, this is a familiar concept, but we put a twist on it because I make it about the room. And I like this because it's kind of a foundation for independence. I give them the sheet, and I give them time to explore the room. But the twist here, too, is that as they stop at each point around the room, I've left a little note. So if they're visiting the pencil sharpener, it might talk about the time of the day when they're allowed to sharpen pencils. Or if they're in the library, it might talk about how we're going to check out books. And I think it's really important that they learn to manage the resources right from the start so that later when you're working, they know how to navigate the room and they don't have to um, stop you when you're like doing small groups. Um, a twist on this would also be to use it for orientation or open house. Our orientation for the first time this year is the night before school starts. So I'm going to give this to my kiddos when they come in with their families and they're going to be able to explore our room. And there's a sample of that in the um, live binder links that you'll get at the end. So the other things you can see on my live binder are links to me at my blog or on Facebook and Pinterest. And then I have some classroom posts on my blog that are related to a caring classroom. Thanks so much, and I hope that was helpful. Thanks, Christy. That was really helpful. I enjoyed it, and it was really fun to actually be able to read the chat and type some things in and listen and feel like I'm a participant. But you had some great strategies, and they were, um, I, I think, uh, I'm uh, really thankful that you are participating with us. Thanks so much. OK, let's move on and hear from uh, Mandy Neal, whose blog is Teaching with Simplicity. And she used to have a blog called Cooperative Learning 365. And that's how I first um, knew about her, because I'm such a fan of cooperative learning. So Mandy, I'll let you take it from here. OK, thanks, Laura. Um, my name is Mandy, as Laura said. And um, I have taught for a total of 10 years. And I've taught fourth, fifth, and sixth grade. 
grades. And like Laura, the upper grades are my thing. I love the upper grades. Um, I live in a small town in southwest Missouri, and my daughter is getting ready to start kindergarten next week. So back to school has taken on a whole new meaning for me. One of my favorite quotes comes from Carl Beekner. They may forget what you said, but they will not forget how you made them feel. I'm going to share with you a number of team building and class building activities. These activities will allow your students to get to know you and their classmates better while still building a foundation for a, classroom, a caring classroom. Um, and I like Christy. Um, I do focus on expectations and procedures, obviously on every level, on the very beginning of the school. But um, I do a lot of the team building and the class building because I think that is very important to get students feeling comfortable with each other. So I will show you the first thing that I, one of the things that I do that tends to be one of my favorites is to find a buddy who is a back to school bingo. And this, you'll see the sheet that's in the front here. Students walk around the classroom um, and ask each other's questions. And once they find, um, they'll instruct students first um, is what you do, is to mix around the room and they will find one person that fits into each square. So if they'll find someone who loves pizza or has a brother or another example, maybe someone that has curly hair, and they will, and if they find that person, that person will write their name in the square. Um, and I instruct my students that they can only ask um, each person one time. So if they ask one of their classmates, they have to move on to someone else because that kind of goes with the whole bingo idea. If you have five names written down, it won't work out that way. Um, so they're mingling around, they're filling out their squares. If a student um, is having trouble, um, eventually it will work out to when the person who has their board filled out, they become what we call an expert, and they have a seat. So those experts become a person that the other students can go to and complete their board if they don't have the name written down. Um, once all students are seated with a completed board, they play bingo. And what I do is I have every student's name written down and on a slip of paper, just like bingo. I'll draw a name, and then they'll mark off the name as they have it on their sheet. And you can play blackout, four down, four across, across or diagonal, just however you want to play it. They really enjoy this game, and it's just a great way just to get to know each other and their names and just to share their talents and their likes. The next one I have is what's in a name. And um, this is one of my favorite books that I read at the beginning, Chrysanthemum. And most of us probably know this book. And I do want to ask a question to all of you to see what kind or what might be your favorite book that you read at the beginning of the year. And in the chat area, we would love to hear of this book or your books that you have an idea for. So, so um, we read this book, and I always bring my students in together, and we come up to like our carpet area, and um, after reading the book, we go back to their tables, and I, like Laura, have my, my students sitting in teams from the very beginning. We, um, I had the students, they turned to their partners, and they explained what their name means and where it came from. And, of course, you will have some of those students who don't know where their name came from or know what it means. So I tell those students 
that if they don't know, then I just want to share, I want them to share with their teammates what they like about their name. That way that all students will make sure that they have something to talk about. After they've shared with each other and their team, I have with their partner, who might be their, what I call a shoulder partner, who are sitting shoulders with them, or they might be also called an eyeball partner, they're sitting across from them. Um, I have them introduce their partner to the class, and they explain what their name means. That way it just kind of gives a little bit of um, talking with, telling the whole class, and that showing them they know their partner. They really like this, and they really like talking about themselves and their names, so it's always a fun activity to do at the beginning. The next activity I have um, I, it's called dominoes, and um, it's similar to the wave that's done at a sports event, so especially like at a baseball game. Um, we all, the students, we all stand in a circle. Um, first, we practice. Um, the wave, because most of them do know this. Um, I always start out, um, after we've done a practice session around a circle and doing the wave, I always start out by doing something funny, whether it's making a funny face or doing jumping jacks or maybe a Zumba move. Um, I start the action and it moves clockwise or sometimes we mix it up and we might go counterclockwise just to kind of get thinking about it. But um, so if I begin, I do the action and the person to my right will do the action and we continue around the circle until it gets back to me. And then the next person to the right will pick some kind of an action whether sometimes they get shy, especially at the beginning of the year. But they might stomp a foot, like I have here, or jump around. There's no telling what they'll do, especially once they get comfortable with each other. It's quite funny to see what they come up with. Um, so the, um, we continue around until um, everyone has a chance to do this. And I do this game at the be beginning of the year, but this is such a great class builder to do any time throughout the year, especially if you're in the middle of a um, a lesson or transitioning between lessons, just something fun to get them up and walking around and getting their mind moving a little bit more. So they, my students always look forward to dominoes. Oops, I'm sorry. The last one I wanted to share with you was the snowball, and lots of us are familiar with this one. Um, we, I give them a sticky note, and you'll see the pictures that I have over on the right side. Um, I have my students write one thing that they are excited about for the new school year. Most of them are, are excited about it, but then I also give them the option to write two things that they're nervous about because we know that most students do definitely get very nervous. Um, I know that I get very nervous. And so this gives them an opportunity to share those feelings. I first model one for them in writing what I'm excited about and also what I'm nervous about. And then once they have this um, all written down, and I'll even participate with them because I think they love to see that the teacher's right in the middle of every bit of it. Um, take the paper and they wad it up. And I split this, um, the students into half. So half um, are one side of the room, half are on the other. And I also have where I, like up on the top, where I have the orange and the blue, not the blue, the orange and the pink sticky notes. Um, that way I can tell if they've gone across the room, the papers have gone across the room. They um, will throw their papers, then the people across the room will pick them up and they will read them. And this is when they will mix and mingle around the room trying to find the owner of that sticky note and who wrote the, st the statement. Um, this gives them the opportunity to listen to what others are feeling also um, beyond just the person that's in their hand. So they're going around, they're questioning each other, and just getting to know each other and feeling comfortable with being around each other and asking questions. And um, I do have, 
um, and um, it will be in the live binder, but a blog post for and a link that you can go to to find directions to every one of these class builders and the team builders that I have talked about here. Um, so in the next page here is um, the links that I'll show, my Facebook, Pinterest, and my blog. Um, there's a link on there to find the activity for all the other activities that I have to find a buddy who, like I mentioned, the icebreaker directions, and then you'll um, see all Thank these you. Things. Thank you, Mandy, so for sharing all those so wonderful cooperative learning and active engagement strategies that um, are great for the beginning of the year, and I'm sure a lot of teachers can think of ways that, and they were sharing in the chat too, how they can adapt them for content area things um, later as well. So thanks a lot for sharing. We are now to Ari Huddleston, um, the science penguin, who is also the math penguin too, but we couldn't do both, so I just did science because I love science. <laughs> so Ari, you can take it away. <laughs> Thanks, Sly. I am having a little bit of an uh, internet connection issue here, so I'm hoping I can make it through this whole thing. <laughs> All right. Right. Um, I'm Ari from the Science Penguin. I teach fifth grade science and social studies in Austin, Texas. And I'm going to first talk about how I involve my students when introducing classroom routines. And then I'm going to explain how I use interest inventories to get to know who my students are as learners. Something that I've worked on a lot since first starting teaching is building that classroom community, getting to know my students, and involving my class in decisions. And I've made a lot of mistakes from the beginning, but I think that also means that I've learned some valuable lessons. All right, so first I want to quickly show you how I like to introduce things in my classroom. Um, we all know that we're supposed to teach procedures the first week of school, but I think my first couple of years I didn't quite understand what teaching procedures really meant. And what I've developed over time is a good strategy that works for me to show my students that I mean business with what we're doing, but I also want to involve them. Um, so when you first look at this slide, um, did you read the text or look at the pictures? I know that I'm very visual, as are many people, and immediately start looking at the photos. I'm trying to figure out why there's a sheep on top of a car, if there's bones under a microscope, and why does my teacher have blue hair? So this is a way to kind of get kids to develop the right kind of anticipation. You can show photos from previous years and ask if they have any questions about what they see. By the way, the blue hair is when I dressed as Coraline for our uh, book character parade. <laughs> so uh, on the bottom, you can see two example slides. I just want to say that the slide on the left is an example of a no-no when making slides. There's too much text, no visuals, difficult readability. It's very blah, and nobody is actually going to read that. On the right is an example of a slide I would use in introducing my classroom. So here's four tips I have when introducing your classroom using slides. Use photos when you're introducing your procedures. Instead of heavy text in a PowerPoint, you can see from the example on the left that that is not working. Uh, also, chunk the information into parts that make sense together. For example, if you're setting up your reader's response notebooks, it would be a good time to discuss how to handle book baskets. So teach and discuss each slide, but not all at one time. You can also go back to review them. Think ahead of time about procedures or decisions that could be made as a class. I like to plan ahead about five to ten things that the class can decide on, and because when they get involved in it, you know how much of a difference that makes. So planning ahead for your kids means that you're planning ahead with for you. If you know what's going on, it'll be easier to explain it to your students. Okay, so now I want to move on to talking about interest inventories. I'll explain how I use them and what I do with, um, with them after the kids fill them out. Interest inventories never affect what I teach, that's the curriculum, but they affect how I teach. So I've seen some great interest inventories that ask about students' favorite shows, their books, colors, subjects, and so on. 
But I also think it's important to understand your students as learners. I made interest inventories for each course subject, history, science, reading, and math. The link to these will be on my live binder page at the end, so don't worry. Uh, you can also easily make your own based on what you study and how you tend to structure your classes. I like to devote a whole page to one subject so that you can get detailed information from your students. You can also notice trends in certain subject areas. Instead of just asking if students like partner work, you can be more specific. Sometimes they like reading in pairs, but they don't want to do math with a partner. So it's important to get that kind of information before you start the year. When making an interest inventory, I start with finding out things students like to do in class. I only include activities that I normally use. Then I want to know what specific topics within the subject that they're most interested in learning. I also want to know if students watch TV shows about the subject or work on things at home. Then, thinking about the specific subject, I want to know if students prefer to work alone, in partners, or in groups. I like to give a few lines at the end for them to tell me what they think about the subject, too. If there's anything else you think would be useful to include on a subject interest inventory, please add it into the chat so we can get your great ideas. Filling out an interest inventory may be a breeze for your kiddos, or it could be a hot mess. In order to prevent any confusion, I go over each inventory with them and fill it out, or and have them fill it out while I explain what's being asked. I get a lot more uh, reliable information that way. After the students have completed an interest inventory, you can do simple, easy prep activities with them that will give you a lot of information and help you determine trends without having to make checklists with crazy amounts of paper. I use some of the questions that I ask for the activities, but I never use the last question. The last question I have on there always asks how the students feel about the subject. I feel like that's more just between you and the student. Um, when students write what they think about a subject, you may get personal information about their struggles that they wouldn't like uh, feel comfortable with sharing with others at the beginning of the year. Um, so here's a few activities that you can do. The activities are classroom left side, right side. I think there's other names for it, but that's what I've always called it. Uh, thinking maps, graphing, and discussion. So the first activity, classroom left side, right side, many of us have used this one in one way or another. For example, if students mark that they like watching science videos, they would go to the right side of the room. If they don't like watching science videos, they go to the left side. If you're familiar with thinking maps, you can use a circle map to write down all of the TV shows about science that students watch or the types of things that students read at home. Um, you can make a bar graph based on students' data of the topics they're interested in. This just takes some prep beforehand to set up the graph. Um, I'm seeing some questions about um, using the in, about how often I use them. I wouldn't use these all in one day. I would spread this out over a couple of weeks so that they don't get bored with it or it, and they can actually share things without having overkill with it on the first day. So I think that the most important part is class discussion. Um, you can have a discussion about how students enjoy learning different things in different ways. We know it as teachers, but our students don't always understand that. This can be how students start to appreciate each other's differences as well as their similarities. I encourage students to share, but don't like to force them right off. I would have hated being put on the spot like that when I was in a new class as a kid, so I try to be respectful of students who need a period of adjustment. Uh, this is a great time to model attentive listening and also thank students for sharing. Um, I think one of the main things I like to do is share how I learn. I tell my classes that I learn best when I hear something and see it. Uh, being personal and human always goes a long way. After students have completed the interest inventories and we've done our activity and we've discussed how we all learn differently, I use the information in a couple of ways. When students think that a topic is exciting, then I might use that topic to introduce an important process skill. 
If one of my students likes to work alone, I try to be considerate of that in a lab atmosphere. Uh, one year I had a group that really enjoyed art, and so I got to incorporate a lot of art into their science station activities. I do want to add something for the, you departmentalized teachers. Um, I've taught in a departmentalized setting all but one of my years teaching. While I've learned a lot by sharing students with other teachers, I think the most important thing I've learned is that students from all classes need to be treated like they're yours. I teach procedures and do my getting to know you activities with all of my classes, not just my homeroom. I think all of your kiddos need to see that you will treat them just like you would in your homeroom class. So uh, departmentalized teachers, I'm seeing some questions there. Um, I teach three classes of science and social studies. And so I'm seeing multiple groups of kids each day. So some things that you can do to get to know those kids are to invite a few at a time to eat with you in your classroom for lunch bunch. Um, if there's time before school starts, you can allow them to come by and say good morning. Um, I can be really forgetful, and I have a lot of students this coming year, and so I'm making an index card for each student where I can jot down things about them to remember. So I am hoping that you have some new ideas for introducing your classroom to your students and using interest inventories. On my live binder, you'll find my social media information. You'll, you can pick up the freebie on TBT with the interest inventories uh, to use as a guide for making your own. I also have um, a Science Lab Team Roles freebie on TBT. Thanks so much for sharing Thank all of you. that with us. You had a lot of great strategies and ways to use interest inventories and some tips for departmentalized teachers. We certainly appreciate you sharing. Um, and we're going to move on to <coughs> Rachel. And <coughs> Rachel, I do not want you to feel pressured for time okay. right now. Okay. The uh, introduction took more than I you know, expected it would take. But these are really good strategies. And I'm quite sure that the participants would not want you to rush through your part just to be done in one minute. We have <laughs> lots of good things that are going on. If they have to leave, they can come back and watch the recording later or whatever. But we, I want you to please take your time. And you have all the time you need because we save the best for last, right? <laughs> Anyways, everybody's great. But please take your time and share because you have a very important piece. And, and that's why I really wanted it to go at the end to sort of wrap up everything. So take it away. Wow, that was quite an introduction. Thank you. <laughs> now I can just take hours. No. That's this right. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'm so glad you're all still here. So I'm Rachel Lynette. I blog over at Minds and Bloom. And um, I most of my background in teaching is in gifted education pretty much all grades, well, up to about fifth. And um, you probably know me, hopefully, from my task cards, because I make a lot of them. But that's not what I'm going to talk about today. I kind of chose an odd subject, I think, for this. Um, but I think it's really important. And I wanted to do it at the start of the year. So I chose um, what to do when you're asking questions, which we do all the time, and a student gives you the wrong answer. And the reason I wanted to talk about it now at the start of the year is because it really is an awesome opportunity to build trust, confidence, and community. And hey, that is exactly what we are doing right now at the start of the year, more now than any other time. And what you do in that moment when you ask a question and the student gives the wrong answer and it's just kind of hanging there, that, um, that makes a huge difference in a lot of ways. It affects a lot of things. Most importantly, how um, your student feels about him or herself. So you can all indicate this in chat. How many of you have had that experience where you were a student and you took the risk, you tried to answer a question, and you got it wrong? And because of what the teacher did after that, it was really embarrassing or even mortifying, and it wasn't a good thing. And obviously, that is not what we want for our students. Um, in fact, when a student gives an incorrect answer, it's an opportunity to lift that student up, not tear them down. Um, it also really plays into how your students feel about you. There's a lot of judgments happening that first few days. They're trying to figure out just what kind of a teacher you are. And of course, you want to be a teacher that makes them feel safe. How the rest of the class feels about the student that's answering the question. So sometimes, often, a student that's struggling academically may also be struggling um, socially. And we all know that some students, some kids, can be kind of mean. 
and um, they do it on the playground when we're not around, and we just don't want to give those students any more um, ammunition for, for that. Um, your students' willingness, of course, to take risks in the future and the overall climate and culture of your classroom are all affected by how you handle wrong answers. So, boy, I haven't even looked at chat here. Wow. Okay. So when you get a wrong answer, oh, it's got a star. Look at that. We should make that go away. When you've got a wrong answer, you've got basically three choices about how you're going to respond. You can help that student to get the right answer. You can move on to another student, or you can give the student the answer. And I've got that crossed off because not a lot of learning is happening when we do that. It's just a great big out for everybody. So we're not even going to talk about that. We're going to start with helping the student to get the correct answer. And my goal here is to give you some new strategies. Of course, you've got dozens of them, I'm sure. You need lots of different strategies for the situation. Um, I'm hoping to give you some new ones and possibly remind you of some that you may have forgotten that you've learned in the past. So the very first thing you can do in that moment is you can rephrase the question. Um, that's a great one. It, first of all, it buys the student just another moment of time to think about it. And using different words can make some connections with not only that student, but the rest of your class. So that's a really obvious one. Um, I really like the asking the student to explain her thinking or his or her thinking. And the reason I like this is because so often it's just like a little misunderstanding. It's just a little thing that hasn't clicked for that student. You clear it up. Everything falls into place. You can see the light bulb in their head. You can see their face light up as they totally get it and give you the right answer. And I just personally love that as a teacher. Um, allow for thinking time. This is really hard for me. What about you? Really hard to be silent, but so important, especially for some of those intro introverted students. They really need us to just stop talking at them so that they can think. Um, oh, yes, I forgot. I want to, I, I just want to give a big shout out to my Facebook followers because um, I asked them for some ideas a couple days ago about this, and they were awesome. They gave me some great ideas. I also read some professional articles written by college professors, and, well, I have to say the Facebook followers really did give me the better ideas. And, that, and one of them is this one, which I've also used to craft a new question that fits the answer given. And um, the reason I like this one is because, first of all, it, um, the student is a face saver. They're answering a question right, even if it's not the one you asked first. But also often giving them the second answer, by having them answer another related question, the answer to the question you originally gave them will come to them. And that's, of course, a great thing. Pear share, yay, pear share. I bet you all love pear share. I love pear share. I'm going to talk about three good things about pear share in this situation. First of all, um, it gets everybody involved. Everybody's talking. You pair those kids up. It's great for an especially challenging question. Second of all, you know you're going to get that answer within a couple minutes. You just give them a minute or two to pair share. And you do know that you're going to get it almost for sure because the student that you've asked that question has now had time to chat with their pair share buddy, and they're almost for sure going to come up with that right answer. Prompt by, go, prompt by going back in time. Now, this was another Facebook one, and I've used it too, but I had totally forgotten that I used this. So this is a great one to remind the student when they learned it. Say you're talking about conductors, and you've called on uh, Jimmy, and Jimmy hasn't a clue what you're talking about. And you say, well, remember when we were working with the batteries and the bulbs yesterday, and we tried the spoon, and we tried the paper clip. And probably Jimmy's going to tune right in and remember that conductors are metal. So going back in time is one. And classmate clue. Now, to the best of my knowledge, I made this up. I'm sure lots and lots of other teachers have used it. But um, since my background was with gifted ed, well, anybody can use it. But um, my students really love this because it got them all going. When we had a really hard question, we would, um, I would let the student who's on the spot ask his friend, ask people to give him clues. So now you've got the whole class thinking, well, what's a good clue? They don't want to make it too easy. They don't want to make it too hard. And if it takes two or three clues, that's great, because now you've got a team approach, and everybody's solving the problem together. And it's really nice for the student who's calling on students, too, because they always love to call on their friends. Keep the question is great when you don't need the answer right away. Maybe you're doing math, and you can ask a similar question, and you can let the student that you gave that tough one keep it, maybe for a few minutes. Maybe that's all he needs to think about it. Maybe for a long time. You can say, 
hey, Johnny, you know, would you like to keep that question till the end of recess? And that's great because when Johnny comes back, you know he's going to have the right answer. So he's had 15 minutes to work it out or ask his friends about it. So that's um, all about ask, that's all about when we want to get that one first student to answer the question. But we all know that's not always a good choice. Um, could be you've got time constraints. Could be that you know that student is not going to benefit by being the center of attention in front of a whole class watching, especially at the beginning of the year. So when you want to move on and ask another student, here's some strategies for that. Now, this first one is actually about a related strategy. A lot of teachers often say, um, who can help Jimmy out with that? And I'm just going to invite you to tweak that a little bit. Instead of saying that, say, who can add to what Jimmy said? Because when you do that, you're implying that Jimmy gave you some value there, that there was some merit in his answer. Even if all he did was eliminate an, a wrong answer and take a risk, he did something there and you're acknowledging him, and that's a happy thing. Another good one is to save that answer. You know when the student an answers the question that you're about to ask, but not the one that you just did ask? So you just go on, you just say save that answer, you go on to another student, get the right answer, and then in a few minutes, when you've got the question that that student answered, you know exactly who to call on, and he is very happy to answer you. So sometimes you don't want to give feedback directly. You just kind of want to be a little more vague, and you think you're going to be asking that question a lot. So you might say, interesting idea. Who else has an idea to share? And what's nice about that one is when you do get to kind of the one that you're targeting, you can talk more about that. And those kids that weren't quite on target, they're going to get that they weren't on target without you actually having to tell them. Finally, thank you for is almost always a great response. Thank you for taking a risk. Thank you for getting us one step closer. Thank you for giving it your best shot. And thank you for your enthusiasm. And on that note, I want to thank all of you for sticking around to the very end because we ran a little bit long. And so I really appreciate that. And let's see. Oh, before we talk about this, my, um, my packet for my, um, for the gift pad, that's what I want to talk about, is my classroom procedure task cards. They're fairly new. Each one has a question. And so you will have an opportunity to try some of these strategies, which is a good thing. And my live binder, I don't know if that's the next slide because I haven't looked. Oh, OK, good. So actually, I'm going to do this. I'm going to talk about live binder. These are the things on my live binder links. I've got some freebies. Um, get to know your Jenga. These are all free. There's a really fun parent night quiz um, that your students do and the parents do. I've got some icebreakers too. Um, and um, I just um, teach like a champion, awesome book, so I put it on there. And finally, I want to leave you with this thought. The best teachers are those who show you where to look, but don't tell you what to see. And thank you. And I want to thank you so much for um, not minding going last. It's a difficult place to be sometimes, but you did a great job. And I think it's a nice way to uh, wrap up <clears throat> the different things that we shared this evening. Um, everybody did a wonderful job. And um, I want to tell everybody thank you from all of us for attending the webinar and uh, for participating and sharing your ideas in the chat. It was fun for me to be able to read and actually um, listen to some ideas that others are sharing and participate myself this time. And I also want to say classroom, thanks to Classroom 20 Live because that's where we're meeting in their classroom where it's not being used. And Peggy, could you tell us a little bit about Classroom 20 Live because I bet you you'll pick up some brand new fans from the 500 and some people that are in the room this evening. Well, I sure will. And this has been such an exciting night. I, I thank you all for what you've shared. And I want you all to know that there are even more things in the Live Binder that they haven't even talked about, resources and additional Live Binders and links. So you're going to have tons to explore later. But Classroom 20 Live is just a gift of love. It's something that several of us educators offer every Saturday. And they are free webinars, just like this one we're doing tonight.
They're all about ways to use technology in your classroom. And we bring in guest speakers for every session. And uh, they may be about the tools. They may be about um, strategies in the classroom. We often bring in the people who created the tools. So we've had the, the people who created live binders do a presentation, and the people who created VoiceThread come and do a presentation. All of them are recorded and archived. And this is the link for our home page. And from that home page, I did put this in the live binder too. From that home page, you can click on the archives and go back and view recordings of any of the earlier sessions. So we welcome you to join us any Saturday. And if you can't make it live, just go in and listen to the recording. They're also on iTunes U. So that's my little Thank bit. Thank you. Thanks, Peggy. And I think if anybody really enjoyed this session, I know they would enjoy your Classroom Tour of Live sessions. And you always have such cutting edge and high tech and just you know neat things that if people want to um, be inspired and know what's going on, then they need to check in with you. Um, OK, well, let's move on then. Um, just another reminder that there, that Peggy put together this awesome Seeds of Success live binder that has all of the things we talked about and more. Um, whoops. And then did somebody put the link in there? Peggy did. Peggy just put the link in the chat. So we'll put that back in there. But let's go ahead and tell about the attendance certificate and so on. And we'll get those links in there in a minute. First of all, when you log off of this webinar, there's going to be a survey that comes up. Don't, don't fill it out because it has to do with Classroom 2.0 Live. So just exit out and don't even, you know, just disregard it. It will ask you if you want a certificate, but that's not how you get it. So you don't need to fill that survey out. Um, you're going to visit the Caring Classroom Resources page or Seeds of Success webinar page, which I'm going to share with you in just a minute, where you're going to be able to download the um, certificate and the Back to School pack. And as I said, it will be available this evening, and it will be available all day tomorrow, but that's it. The, those things will no longer be available after that. So here's the, um, the link. And um, it looks like uh, Francie's already put it in there for you. It's larcandler.com forward slash webinars, SOS for Seeds of Success, webinar, PHP, that's the ending. And please, if you are not clicking on a link, if you're typing it, you've got to be super careful. Like it's Candler, not Chandler, and it's webinars. You know, it's like people email me afterwards that they couldn't get it, and then it turns out it's just like one little letter off. So um, I'm going to leave that up there for just a moment. And I do want to tell you that the five um, gifts that we're giving you, each one of us is giving you uh, one back to school item, and that zip file is huge. It took for like five minutes for it to download on my computer when I was practicing. So what I did is under that zip file, you'll see a list of each of the five titles separately. And if I were you, I would just click on each one. It will open as a PDF file and then just save it. And um, just a reminder that these are you know, um, products that we're giving you for this evening. So they're not really freebies to just give out to others. They're kind of like a gift for you being here at the live webinar. So Francie has put the link in there again a couple of times. And um, I'm going to move forward to the next slide. And then I can go back and bring that other one up too. Um, so now if you have questions that haven't been answered, you can type them into the chat. If you really you know, would like to use the microphone and ask us personally, that's fine. Um, if you have a question uh, for a specific presenter, address the question to her by name. And I see a couple of hands went up. And I would say um, it's best if you have a headset on, because we can get some pretty bad feedback and everything, but we can give it a try. And I did want to mention I saw a lot of people asking about the clip art that I used in putting the presentation together. And it's by an artist who goes by Whimsy Clips. And uh, that's her Teachers Pay Teachers store. But she also has a website. Um, mycutegraphics.com. And uh, so um, I certainly want to give her credit. She, she's got some really cute stuff. I enjoyed using it. OK, so um, Peggy, you usually do the questions, but it looks like we've got a couple of people who want to take the microphone. So could I let you um, talk with them about what they need and sort of handle that? 
actually I had my hand up because there are two things that I, I wanted to see it. I know it's there. Oh, <laughs> I, I keep scrolling down part yeah. way. Okay, go ahead, okay. Sorry. Um, there are two things people have been asking about that we promised we would tell okay. them about. For okay. me, if you could go back to the Live Binder slide for just one second. Sure. Lots of people are new to Live Binders. Thanks a lot. Sure. And mm -hmm. I wanted to point out that when they go to that link, there are tabs and there are sub tabs. It's just like a three ring binder, or it only it's electronic. So when you click on a tab, all the sub tabs open up underneath that tab. So if you click on Laura's name, it will open up to a whole bunch of other links underneath her name. And if you click on Christie's link, the same thing happens. So there really are tons of resources within that live binder. And um, then you will be able to access any of them. And they come up as websites so that you can even click on links within the websites that are there for you. The other thing I wanted to mention, we told you you can all save the chat. Now, we are saving it for you, and Laura will post that for you. But um, if you want to save either the chat or the slides, you go up to File, right? the menu up at the top of the page, and you go to Save, and you choose either chat or whiteboard. If you save the chat, it's going to ask you to give it a name and tell it where you want to save it. That will save everything in the chat from the time you entered the room. If you want to save all the slides, you select whiteboard and you say all pages, give it a name, and save it as a PDF file. If you save it as any of those other things, you won't be able to open it on your computer. They're all Blackboard Collaborate um, um, boards. But save it as a PDF, and you'll have all of those slides there. A number of people were asking about that. So for questions, Laura, there weren't a whole lot of questions, and so many of them were flying by so fast it was really hard to grab them. But I, I did know. have a few. I could uh, go ahead and call mm -hmm. on the people that have their hands raised and let them ask their question. Mm -hmm. And then if, if they don't cover the ones I saved, we can go back to mine. So let's start with Angie. Yes. Angie, you had well, your let hand me, raised. I wanted to mention. So I'm going to give you the mic. OK. Go ahead. Do you want to talk, Laura? Angie? OK, I, I just wanted to mention that this uh, live binder here is also on the page that has the attendance certificate. So the easiest way to get to a live binder, if you're going to go to both pages eventually, is to go to this page right here. And at the bottom, if you scroll down under the gift pack and everything, I actually have the live binder right there, too, to make it really easy. Um, somebody just put in the chat, you can't get the download zip to work. All right. Remember how I said that the zip file took like five minutes to download on my computer? You might not even see that it's downloading, but like on Chrome, I could see it. But don't worry about it, because you just go under the zip, and there's like all five of those products are there in individual links. So the zip file was just for people who want to just download it all in one folder. But um, really, don't worry about it. Just go down underneath and just click on each of the five titles. Um, so I don't, is there anybody who is able to get it? Can somebody post in here that they did get it? Because I'm getting people saying it's not, but like every one of the presenters, went to that page and we checked on it and it seems to be working. Laura, so, someone had okay. a, an right, interesting question yes. uh, about your stoplight system. They wanted to know if you changed off of green to yellow or another color, if you could be really good and go back to green. Oh, you know what, that is such a good question. And um, that's why I really like the question and answer section at the end, because questions like that come up that I don't think talk about. And the answer is a big, fat no. <laughs> because if you ever let a kid talk you into putting that back, you will have nothing but one argument after another. Like, don't ever do it. 
you know, maybe like some rare situation where the student wrote a letter and I was completely wrong and then, you know, I mean, I'm saying like maybe like once a year I might just admit, okay, I'm, you know, I was wrong about this, but as a general rule, like I have seen teachers use it and substitutes will come in and I use it and the kids will say, Mrs. Candler, by the end of the day, everybody was on yellow, but she kept saying if we were good, she would put them all back and then she put them all back. And I'm just thinking, oh my gosh, <laughs> you know, so um, no, I would not, I, I think very long and hard before I change somebody to yellow. But you know, like I said, yellow is nothing but like a little recording on the clipboard. I don't really do anything for yellow, so um, there's no reason to try to talk me into turning it back. It's just yellow, you know, it's not like a big deal. So anyways, that's my take on it. I don't know about how other people use it. Um, I do want to switch because I see a couple of hands, and I don't know if they're accidental or not, but Yolanda Johnson has her hand up. Yolanda, if you have a microphone, um, let's see if we can um, give you um, permission. Do I just right click on her name and um, give she her audio permission? She said that was a mistake and she doesn't have a microphone. Oh, hello. Okay, so we will lower her hand. Oh, no? just, hello. I just turned her off, I guess. Hello. Who's speaking? Yolanda. Who is speaking? Yolanda. Okay. Yolanda, did you have a question? Yes. I wanted to know how I could group my students um, with an odd number. Like I have 25, and so there's going to be that odd mm -hmm. person out. So. Right, and that's a very good question too because pretty much half the time we're going to end up with an odd number of students. So it depends on your classroom arrangement and your space requirement. I prefer to have a couple of teams of three because I find teams of five to be kind of unmanageable. When you have a team of five, you've got that one student like sitting mm -hmm. out at the end and they don't seem to be as involved. Um, if I have to have a team of five, I will put the most outgoing student at the end because I know that they're going to more or less get up and be involved. I won't put the quiet child down there, but I prefer um, teams of three if there's space. But I will say there have been years when I had large classes and I did have to just put an extra table at the end and have a team of five. The other thing is if you have a student who's absent a lot, if you make a team of five and have that student in the team of five, I'm not going to say that you should put them at the end of the table because they're already kind uh -huh. of an isolated child, but um, by having them in that team of five, the days when they're absent or maybe they're pulled out for special ed type things, then it kind of puts it okay. down to a team Thank of four. Thank you. So, good question. Sure. Okay. And then we had Ray Ann had um, a hand up. Ray Ann, did, did you want to speak? Can you hear me? Anybody? Okay. Great. I can hear you. Um, this so one, yes. Um, thanks, Peggy, for troubleshooting the saving of the board in the chat. It's really helpful. Um, I had some trouble figuring it out, so I really appreciate it. Um, also, not to uh -huh. um, kind of be yeah. a dead horse here with the Go Green system, um, but my what I've done in my uh -huh. classroom is it was a little bit different. It was called a reminder board. It was, I mean, it was similar with the kind of red, yellow, um, green thing. But what we did was um, kind of at a natural, usually it was at the end of a lesson or after a lunch, we would kind of replace the boards. Is that ever something that you have done with your groups, or is it usually at the end of the day? I'm, I'm sorry. I, I'm having a hard time hearing you. I don't know if there's, it seems like there's oh, background I mean, noise. Are you like well, in a car outside? Or Can you, you hear me? <laughs> oh, okay, yeah, I'm sorry. sorry. I didn't even yeah. think about that. <laughs> okay, could you uh, okay, could you, could you just repeat yes. the last question part? Because I kind of was keeping um, up with you. And then, so I'm wondering what did you if say the last you have part? ever, with the green, uh, the go to green system, if you've ever mm -hmm. um, right. considered putting back, kind of starting over at green after a subject or at halfway through the day. I know that I've done that in my classroom. Oh. So I'm just wondering if that's something you've considered or tried mm -hmm. or anything like that. Mm -hmm. I don't. Um, I think I think pretty hard before I change okay. the color tags, and I don't like if I had a new group coming in. Of course, like if you're teaching four classes, you know, you use a stoplight system, and then when the new class came in, obviously they'd all have numbers, and you'd start them back over. But I don't um, put it back um, because I do. Um, 
I'm somewhat lenient. I mean, I, you know, I look at them. I might walk by and kind of, you know, they know that that I have my eye on them a bit before I ever go to, you know, change that tag. And then after that, they usually settle down. And, you know, um, then I would think pretty long and hard before I would turn to orange. So maybe I might turn a blind <laughs> eye to some little things. So, I mean, I guess it's how you implement it yourself if it works for you to turn them back after lunch. You know, if you're more strict than I am about turning them to yellow, then you might feel like after lunch you want to turn them all back. I think anything's fine as long as you're consistent with it and it's working. I think when it gets to be a situation where kids are bargaining with you and begging you to change them back, and then you're losing the whole benefit of having this nice... Can I ask system. a follow-up question? So, anyways, that, that's related. Um, how do you, mm -hmm. in terms of the sure. number system, do this, obviously the students know they're our number. Um, do you ever run into a situation where other students are picking up on the numbers of the other kids? Yeah, oh, they okay. all know them. <laughs> the fifth graders, by the end of the second day, they know the numbers. It's more for visitors. Like if somebody comes in the room and there's a couple of kids on yellow and orange, I don't want their names on the pockets and it to be kind of embarrassing to them that they're in trouble. But um, there's no way to keep the children from knowing. They know <laughs> faster than I do. You know, I'll still have to go pull up my chart and say who's number three after three weeks of school, and they're all just looking. You know, <laughs> they know. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Okay, thanks. Sure. And uh, Christine um, looks like Christine had a question. So I see if um, give her audio. Christine. Do you have a question for us? OK. Maybe that was a mistake. So I'll just lower the hand there. All right. And Jessica? Uh, let's see if Jessica. Jessica, you have the microphone if you want to talk. Do you have a question? Laura, she chatted in the yeah, chat box. She Jessica. said, my microphone isn't working. I have a stoplight system, but mine only okay. has green, yellow, and red. What do you do for the minor things? OK. Uh, add another color to your stoplight. <laughs> it's the beginning of a year. Start over and get a new stoplight. Uh, that's really what I would say is I could not do it. it. It would. I guess the only thing I would do is if I had to keep the same colors, um, I would not have red be the ultimate worst thing. I would have something else that was, you know, red would be like orange to me, and then um, some major infraction would be like beyond the stoplight kind of thing is what I would do. But um, I, it really works well to have that extra level. OK. And Chris, did Christine have a question? Her hand's back up again, so I'm, I don't know if it's, I want to just lower her hand again just to see. And Katie? Hello? Um, did Katie have a question? Hello? Can you hear me, Laura? This is and Christine. who is speaking? OK, Christine? Yes? I could hear you. Did I you have a question? I have a question and a comment. I totally agree with you on not arguing with children. But I know myself that if, uh -huh. if I was in the classroom with the red light, green light, and I got onto a, a different color, uh -huh. and I knew there was no way to get back, I just shut down like that. Had that. Had um. You know, I really never, I never had any problem at all with kids shutting down. I think it's just because it was just a part of the way that we did our classroom. The kids understood that we have to have rules in the classroom. And you know, you got 25 kids in there. They can't talk out of turn. I didn't make a big deal about it. It wasn't like a horrible thing, it, you know. Um, uh, I mean, you know, you can do whatever you want to in your classroom. I'm just saying, in my experience, if you get, you know, I, I did say that if somebody was upset, they could write me a letter about it if they felt like it was wrong. Um, but I never, I cannot remember ever having a problem with a child just shutting down because of having their tag. Most of those kids, you know, they just stayed on green all the time. You know, I mean, I, I didn't change it for every tiny little thing. My kids were active. They talked. They worked together. 
you know, it was only like when they were just being really rude or like when I was giving some directions and they kept talking over me out of turn. So um, I wasn't just like a total meanie about it. It was just for when kids were, you know, really out of turn. No, I wasn't. So, I, um, right. I, I don't know how to answer your question because but I really can't. My kids were pretty open and honest with me, and they talked with me about things. And some kids, from time to time, would write me a letter and, you know, tell me why maybe they thought it wasn't fair or something. But, um, Peggy, you were in my classroom too. You saw me using it. I don't know. I guess it's just the way you um, implement it. It's something to be aware of and something to be sensitive of too. Um, I'm sure. Well, it's Christy here. I thought I would add to that that I had a student mm -hmm. this year. I use a very similar system sure. in my classroom, and he would completely break down. Yeah, he sure. would burst into tears. He would cry. He'd say his parents were going to be upset with him. But instead of negotiating backwards mm -hmm. with him, one thing we did is we talked about what he'd be able to do in the future to avoid getting his to that level, mm -hmm. and that really worked really well. Mm -hmm. You know what? I'm <clears throat> I'm really glad you jumped in because you sure. said you teach third grade, right. right, Christy? And as when I when I'm responding from my <clears throat> perspective of doing most of the years in fifth grade, you know, people in the webinar need to be aware. I'm speaking as a fifth grade teacher, so you can't look at what Laura says and say this is you know this is how it has to be, or this is just like my perspective because I think for younger kids. Definitely, you could run into those situations where kids would be very upset, and you have to come up with another plan. So, it, you know, well, I do remember I had some kids that were very, very quick to get on yellow, and I actually did start some other systems with them. Like one student, he was so impulsive, I could not use the stoplight thing because he'd be on yellow just, you know, within 15 minutes. So what I did is I had some like little things on the corner of his desk. I can't remember if it was little popsicle sticks or what it was, but there was like three of them there. <clears throat> and it was a little private thing I had with him. And when he was doing something he wasn't supposed to do, I just walked over to his desk and I picked one up. I didn't say anything to anybody else, but he knew that was like strike one. <clears throat> and it took me like picking up three popsicle sticks off of his desk before he actually, you know, turned to yellow on the chart. But it kind of helped him <clears throat> recognize he just didn't even know. He was like blurting out all the time, and he had no control, and he didn't even know he was doing it. Sometimes I'd go pick up a popsicle stick, and his eyes would get real big because he honestly didn't realize that those words had just come out of his mouth, you know, at the wrong time. So I do think for younger kids and certain kids, um, you do have to be sensitive to that whole issue. And if somebody's going to be on yellow within 10 minutes, you're going to need something else. You know, for that for that student. So these are all really good questions, and thanks for jumping in on that, Christy, because that that's a really good point. Is that good then? <clears throat> Anybody else have any? Any of my other presenters have anything they want to share on that? Okay, and Katie <clears throat> has had her hand up. She has um, audio privileges. I don't know if she still wants to ask a question. Maybe she raised her hand accidentally. Okay, uh, Jennifer, um, hand went up. Jennifer, did you have a question? I don't know if people are just testing out the hand raising <laughs> feature or not. How about this? If you would like to speak, could you put something in the chat box and say that you would like to speak? Because hands keep going up, but when I give them audio privileges. Laura, why don't we have Ari speak? Because okay. Alyssa has a question right in the chat box. Ari, do you want to answer Alyssa's question? I would love to answer her question, but I don't Where is see it. it. <laughs> Can someone read it out for me? <laughs> That's what I was going to say, too. What's the question, Francie? Do you remember? OK, yes, I see right there. So it says, on the math inventory sheet, do you ask the students to list math problems they are afraid of, like fractions, decimals, word problems? I don't, but that's definitely a great idea. Um, I was looking for feedback from y'all, and that's one of the reasons I asked for it, so that I could. It's something that can always be revised and can always be changed. And so I think that's a great question to be mm -hmm. added on to the ones that I made. 
Okay. Um, I just noticed a question in the chat area. Sheila is writing, I don't um, have a microphone, but what kinds of consequences do you give for the orange and red levels? Well, <clears throat> you're in luck if you go download that whole 15-page um, go for green stoplight management um, thing that's in the gift pack because I go into all of that. There's printables to use. There's ideas for um, time. What I did is <clears throat> my main thing was a timeout sheet, which is in that pack. <clears throat> Excuse me, I guess the talking's getting to me here this evening. But I use a timeout sheet that I have to fill out. You know, what did I do wrong? You know, what could I, what's a better choice I could make? That sort of thing. And then I sign it, they sign it, then they have to take it home to their parents. Another thing that I found was effective, you know, some people might um, not like this idea and might, it may, may not be viable for them. But I um, always like to find another teacher on my grade level where we could agree to have a timeout place in each other's classrooms where if I had a student who had to fill out a timeout sheet, then he might go over to Miss Bailey's classroom, sit at the back of her classroom and fill it out and then come back. And um, we had an agreement together, so she might send one to me too. You would never do that without having an agreement. But I found that sometimes if you've got a kid that's really wanting to get attention and everything, it's best if even if it's just five or ten minutes outside of your classroom to go sit at the back of another teacher's classroom and have to fill out the form or even just sit there and read a book for just a short while kind of gives everybody a breather. Um, I mean, you would need to check with your administrator to see if they're okay with that, you know. Um, but to me, that was an intermediate step. You just don't want to be sending kids to the office all the time because, you know, it's kind of an ineffective strategy and a lot of times at the office they're they're not going to be able to do a lot, and you need to save that, you know, for the occasional, you know, fight or whatever the big thing is that you need to um, send them there for. So, okay, um, let's keep on looking at whatever questions are coming up in the chat area because um, it seems. Does anybody else have um, something for us? If it didn't get answered a minute ago, just pop it back in there. Um, Susan, Peggy wrote that Susan wanted a refresher. Rachel, on the the clue, the classroom clue strategy, could you kind of explain that one more time? Oh, there it is. And real quickly, Abby, um, I'll be sending out the webinar link. Um, sorry, Rachel, I just saw Abby said she had to go. I'll be sending out a webinar link, a recording link um, tomorrow. Um, try, I'll try to do it as early in the day as I can. So, you know, it will be available tomorrow. Okay, so, sorry. Okay. So classroom ahead, clue Rachel. is when you've got a particularly challenging question that um, somebody is really struggling on, um, you, can ask them, but you can ask them if they'd like a clue, and then the rest of the students all think about a clue that um, they think would help that student. And what's great about that is they really have to think about it. They don't want to give it away, but it needs to be a useful clue, too. So I love it for critical thinking. And then the student who's struggling can call on people until he gets the question and you've got this great teamwork approach that's coming. And once you've done it a few times, your kids will, you know, they'll, they'll know the drill and it gets a lot easier to use. So does that answer the question? Mm -hmm. Rachel? Rachel, while you were talking um, about that, a lot of people were putting something in the chat area ah. called phone a friend. Do you, do you use that? Or maybe somebody who was putting that in the chat area could kind of explain what they meant by that. So they just allow <coughs> allow them to call on a friend for help, I guess. I, I, don't, I wasn't really sure. But a lot of people were saying that was a good strategy, but I never saw anybody really exactly say. I never used um, it. I've heard of it. Um, I think that was. somebody else should probably explain that one since I've never actually used it. Yeah. OK. All right, somebody, I use a phone a friend after they raise their hand and can't answer. I'll ask them if they need to phone a friend. So what does that mean? They allow, they're allowed to call on somebody else to answer for them? More or less, I guess. But maybe, maybe it's kind of, it sounded to me like it was sort of like the classroom clue, like maybe they could phone a friend. And um, yeah, I did recognize it came from the TV show, but I wasn't really sure how it was used. Maybe it's kind of like classroom clue, where they can phone a friend and get a clue and ask for help, but they can't actually tell them the answer. They can just give them some kind of a clue or something. 
Rachel, when you said um, you had them do pair share when they weren't getting the answer, did you mean that you had the whole class like pair up with a partner and discuss it? Or were you just saying for the student to turn to a friend oh, and have sorry. an opportunity I, to talk? I took yeah, it, the whole class. It, Otherwise, whole everyone's class. going to get pretty bored listening to them talk. <laughs> Right, that's kind of what I was thinking, but I, I wanted to make it sound like, so you were saying, well, let's all do a pair share on this, rather than saying the kid's wrong, okay, let's pair up and let's talk about it among your partners, and then that way it kind of gives, that kid gets an opportunity to get some help with it. Yeah, that's really great when you've got just a really killer question, everybody's okay. struggling, um, or most of them are struggling. Right, gets everybody involved with it, okay. All right, well, um, this was really fabulous. I'm just so thrilled that you ladies um, agreed to join me. It just turned out even better than I could have imagined. Um, it was just so fun to hear different people talking, not just me the whole time, getting different kinds of strategies, and they're all really good strategies for the beginning of the year. So um, I'm hoping that those who are in the room here and are listening will share this webinar with your colleagues and uh, send them to the webinar page, and you'll check out everyone's blogs and the information in the Life Binder and so on. So um, I think we'll be stopping the recording. You're right, Peggy, we do need to stop the recording. So let me